My name is Jaspreet Jahal, and I am a uh, Clinical Anatomy Research Fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And I'm going to be talking to you today about a case that we recently published in the uh, journal Curious, detailing a wormian bone within the anterior fontanelle of a six-month-old female. But before we get into the actual details of the case, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the topic, define some terms for you guys, as well as go over the normal development of the skull. So as we probably all know, the skull usually develops as a series of large flat bones. And when you're born, these bones are separated by bony sutures. And as the infant, as the neonate ages and goes through development, those suture lines are then going to come together. And uh, fusion of these bones can occur improperly. And that's very often one of the earliest signs of clinical pathology is improper formation of these bony sutures. And uh, at the junction of the sutures, we have what are called the fontanelles. And those fontanelles can also have delayed closure, which results in other conditions as well. So this here would be an image outlining the major sutures of the, of the skull. So at the front, we have the coronal suture going from left to right. Down the middle, there's a sagittal suture. And at the back is the lambdoid suture. And then you have the two fontanelles, so the anterior fontanelle or the frontal fontanelle, and then the occipital fontanelle or the posterior fontanelle. But the, the clinical pathology or the deformity that we're going to be talking about today is wormian bones. So wormian bones are basically supernumerary or extra bones within the skull that aren't supposed to be there. Their underlying etiology is uh, from abnormal ossification centers, but we don't really know why these ossification centers form. Uh, and they're usually found in the suture lines of the bones. Now, when Dr. Tubbs first gave me this topic, I was like, oh, cool, maybe this is talking about wormian bones because they're worm-shaped or something. But they're actually called wormian because they're named after the Dutch anatomist Olaus Wormius, who was the first to describe this finding in the 17th century. Uh, and even today, there's not really a whole lot of case reports outlining their discovery, even though they are relatively common in the population. And that's most likely because for the most part, they don't really cause any sort of symptoms or underlying pathology. Their greatest clinical significance is because they're associated with other disorders. So now I'm going to go into a little bit of the anatomy as well as the occurrence and the clinical significance of this deformity. So like I said, the end result is the formation of isolated pieces of bone in various regions of the skull. Uh, they're most commonly located within the bony sutures rather than the fontanelles. And of the sutures, around 50% occur within the lambdoid suture, 25% occurring within the coronal suture, and the remaining usually occur in other regions of the developing skull, such as the bregma, the lambda, and the tyrion. Uh, they're usually unilateral rather than bilateral in occurrence. And for some reason, they're more common on the right side than on the left side, but there's different theories as to why that may occur. Uh, and just to give you a quick outline of what exactly it is that I'm talking about, there's two skull samples here that show uh, wormian bones. So on the left, we see the presence of wormian bones along the uh, lambdoid suture on the back of the skull. So as you guys will notice, if we follow the lambdoid suture here across, there's these bones here, right here and right here. They're not supposed to be there. So these are abnormal bones that are formed uh, within that suture. And they're more commonly occurring within those sutures rather than at the fontanelle as well. So the fontanelle would be here, the posterior fontanelle, wormian bones are occurring within the suture itself. And then the image on the right is again showing a wormian bone, but this time instead of on the back of the skull, it's occurring on the side of the skull. So this is your squamosal suture, and this is a wormian bone that's occurring within that squamosal suture. So again, they can be found and preserved in uh, cadaveric samples as well, and oft most often they're just not. So this case report, like I mentioned, talks about wormian bones within the fontanelles themselves. This is a much more rare occurrence. So the fontanelles exist at the junction of bony sutures. The anterior fontanelle is made up of the sagittal, metopic, and coronal sutures, and the posterior fontanelle is made up of the sagittal and lambdoidal sutures. Uh, and within, this, within the fontanelles themselves, they're more commonly occurring at the back of the head than at the front of the head. And this might just be by chance due to anatomy, but a lot of researchers have actually posited that when you have a newborn, a neonate, an infant, when you put them to bed at rest, they're going to be in the supine position, right? And that increased pressure on the back of the head actually causes uh, these wormian bones to form at the back of the head. So we'll get into that a little bit more when I talk about the clinical occurrence of this uh, deformity. And 
they are significantly common in the population. Some studies have said that they might be in up to 15% of the population, but as I mentioned before, they're just not picked up and they're not really followed clinically because they don't cause much pathology. And for some reason, they seem to be more common amongst the Chinese population compared to the general population. So their greatest clinical significance arises from their correlation with other bony dysplasias. So they do have a uh, sort of a correlation with diseases like osteogenesis imperfecta, rickets disease, as well as various cranial dysostoses. And I'll talk more about those as we go on. Uh, they're also more commonly seen in crania that are circumferentially and anteroposteriorly deformed. So any sort of deformation of the skull that occurs early in the neonate, this might be due to a difficult vaginal delivery or in some cultural practices, in some cultural traditions, there's actually intentional manipulation of the skull, of the crania. And those sort of uh, traditions might also cause formation of wormian bones. They're also more commonly seen in infants with hydrocephalus. So if you think about a kid with hydrocephalus, they're going to have increased intracranial pressure. That pressure is going to push out on the developing bony sutures. And that's going to cause the formation of these wormian bones. Uh, to summarize, there's scant literature reports. There's very few reports on their occurrence as well as their clinical associations. And there's definitely a need for more, more data to sort of verify any of these hypotheses. <laughs> And uh, again, these are just some more images of what I talked about before. So the image on the left here, this one appears to show a wormian bone that's sort of more so at the fontanelle rather than right within the suture. And then the one on the right is just showing a series of more wormian bones. So there's actually about three or four separate wormian bones here occurring within the squamosal suture. Uh, so talking a little bit more now about their clinical significance and their associations. So. As I've mentioned before, they don't really cause a whole lot of symptoms. Their greatest clinical utility comes from the fact that they can sort of suggest other underlying disorders. So they are used as a diagnostic tool by, pediat by pediatricians and pediatric neurosurgeons as sort of a silent marker or indicator for other disorders of bone development and metabolism. So for a disease like osteogenesis imperfecta, as a kid ages, they're going to have a lot of bony fractures, et cetera, right? And the presence of wormian bones, it might sort of help distinguish us from other causes of unexplained fractures like child abuse or other disorders of bone metabolism and mineralization. Uh, out of, when we are examining wormian bones and when we're working up a kid with wormian bones, there are certain features that uh, you want to look at that might sort of increase their clinical significance or their pathological significance. And this was, I took this from a paper that was uh, sort of a comprehensive review of the wormian bones. And that paper concluded that when you have one patient with at least 10 or more wormian bones, or when the bones are arranged in a mosaic-like pattern, so what they mean by that is basically one bone next to the other, instead of them being all over the skull. And when you have individual bones that are greater than six millimeter by four millimeter in size, these are the type of bones that are gonna more likely cause uh, problems uh, downstream, and they need to be operated on uh, by a pediatric neurosurgeon. And again, if they're associated with other clinical syndromes or anomalies, that's when they're going to be problematic. Uh, the take-home point from all my research was that there's no specific factors that have been verified, and there's a whole bunch of different hypotheses that have been suggested. But ultimately, it's a combination of genetic and uh, environmental factors that causes their occurrence. Uh, some specific environmental causes that I came across during my research. So some have suggested that wormian bones in the back of the head they have more of an environmental etiology. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Chinese, in the Chinese culture, there's a tradition of prolonged supine infant sleep positioning. And uh, reports have said that these childs have an increased incidence of wormian bones. And other cultures have traditions of intentional cranial deformation, as well as skull manipulation, specifically populations of Northwest Pacific Coast uh, Native Americans, as well as some groups of Mayans in Mexico. And they've also been shown to have increased incidence of this and other skull deformations. And the two most common clinical anomalies are cranial dysostosis and osteogenesis imperfecta. So cranial dysostosis just refers to premature closure of the cranial sutures. And when these sutures uh, close uh, prematurely, you can have wormian bone formation at the site of the synostosis. And then osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, for those of us that may not be aware, it's a genetic disorder from mutation for genes for type 1 collagen. Basically, the end result is that kids have fragile bones and they're prone to bony fractures. 
And what that causes in the skull is they get basilar abnormalities because you have abnormally soft skull bones that can't support the weight of the brain as well as the cranial vault. And these basilar abnormalities lead to wormy in bones because of increased pressure on the developing sutures. All right, so getting into the specifics of the case discussion. So we know wormy in bones themselves are rare, but it's even more rare to find wormy in bones within the anterior fontanelle. And they most commonly form in the anterior fontanelle if that fontanelle has failed to close properly. So usually anterior fontanelles or fontanelles in general, they're gonna be expected to be fully closed by the age of 12 to 18 months. And their failure to close is usually caused by some sort of underlying pathology like achondroplasia, hypothyroidism, or Down syndrome. And the fontanelle exam itself is actually an important part of the pediatric wellness check. So if you have a child with bulging anterior fontanelle, that can be a sign of increased intracranial pressure or some sort of infection like meningitis or encephalitis. Whereas a sunken or depressed anterior fontanelle, that's usually a sign of poor nutrition or dehydration. So the fontanelles themselves are a very important indicator of the overall status of the child. Uh, the specifics of the case itself that we wrote up was we had a six month old female who initially presented with a uh, small head circumference and hypotelorism. Uh, and she had no significant birth history, no family history, as well as any other complaints or concerns. Uh, upon closer examination, the child was found to have uh, left and right uh, coronal sutures, ridges, sorry, a ridging of the left and right coronal sutures, as well as incomplete closure of the sagittal suture and an open and tense anterior fontanelle. Upon depalpation, they found that there was a bony island in the center of the anterior fontanelle. And the suspicion was that there was a wormian bone and this was uh, confirmed with imaging. So what we see here is actually a, 3T, a 3D CT reconstruction of the patient that we talked about in the case. So the white arrow at the top shows the uh, wormian bone right in the middle of the anterior fontanelle. And then on the black, the black arrow here, the black vertical arrow, this is showing the ridging of the coronal suture on the left and right side. So the child, about a month later, the child underwent operative release of the coronal suture. And at that time, the, uh, the bone within the anterior fontanelle was also removed. Upon examination, the or during the surgery rather, it was seen that the bone was uh, significantly attached to the underlying dura as well as the superior sagittal sinus. So this was something to be aware of during the procedure. Uh, at one year follow-up post-op, the patient has no neurological problems. The child is meeting all of her developmental milestones and the parents have no concerns. So the surgery was a success and uh, probably the indications for the surgery were more so to avoid uh, any sort of significant deformities, but the child is meeting all of their developmental milestones. Uh, and the conclusions or the takeaways from this research as well as from this presentation, uh, wormian bones themselves aren't really that big of a significant deformity uh, clinically. They can be uh, associated with underlying or hidden disorders of bone metabolism. So for the pediatric, for the pediatrician and for the pediatric neurosurgeon, they are important indicators. And if you do come across one on exam, it's important to sort of keep other diagnoses in mind. Uh, we haven't really established what the underlying cause is, so there's definitely a need for further case reports to verify associations. Other associations that I came across were that there might be associations with like midline abdominal defects or uh, other facial dyscrasias. So just we need just more significant reporting to sort of verify these claims. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I just wanted to give a special shout out to Dr. Tubbs and the entire SSF team for their hospitality and for letting us do research here. Uh, these are my references. Thank you for your time.